Good evening and welcome to Rural America Live. I'm John Jenkinson. Joining us tonight in studio, there are three crop nutrition experts here to talk about soil fertility and balanced crop nutrition. We have senior agronomist Kurt Wolfolk from Mosaic, technical sales manager Sherry Cook, and Dr. Ross Bender is the world's largest supplier of phosphate and potash, a leader in the crop nutrition industry. The Mosaic Company offers a portfolio of fertilizer products designed to boost yield performance and provides a variety of information on nutrient deficiency solutions, soil fertility best practices, and there's more on their website at cropnutrition.com. So, Kurt, let's start with you. Uh, let's uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and how you got to Mosaic. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Kurt Wolfolk, Senior Agronomist for uh, Western North America. So, uh, I support our technical sales managers and our account managers. Do a lot of uh, training on balanced crop nutrition and premium products. I'm out of our uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota office, but uh, travel a fair amount. So, uh, prior to that, I spent 12 years in precision ag. So, uh, got a background degree in, in soil fertility from Oklahoma State University, and, and that's that. Okay, very good. Dr. Bender, uh, welcome to the program. Tell us a little bit about your yes. background. Thank you very much for having us. I grew up on a farm in eastern Wisconsin. My wife and I have a couple kids at home. They're going to be the fourth generation on that farm. They don't know it yet, but uh, they're <laughs> going to be. Uh, and I went to school at UW-River Falls and then migrated down to uh, Champaign, Illinois for a little bit with Dr. Fred Bilo. Mm -hmm. Seven Wonders of the Corn Yield World and Six Secrets of Soybean Success and understanding what the nutritional needs are for those high yielding crops and then how to sustain those from a fertility standpoint. And that's led to my transition here into Mosaic as senior agronomist for Eastern North America, like what Kurt does, but for the other half of the, the country. Yep. And you got a couple of special guests here tonight as well. Yes, my parents are uh, in, in studio. Yep. Thank uh, you. Okay, yep. very good. And we welcome them. Glad that they were able to join us here tonight. Right. Thank you. Sherry Cook is here with us as well. Sherry, tell us a little bit about uh, how you got to this point. Thank you. I started my career born and raised on a small dairy and gray farm in central North Dakota. And I spent 15 years working retail sales, selling to customers, selling to farmers, um, most of their inputs, and then transitioned into some wholesale and retail products and have been with Mosaic for about seven years now. Okay, well, we appreciate all of you being, uh, being here tonight on the program. Uh, we got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get right started at it uh, right, right here and right away. Uh, first of all, uh, Kurt, let's, let's start with you and, and talk about what do growers need to, to be able to do to be able to start a discussion when it comes to balancing crop nutrition? Because it's, it's not about uh, just looking at a field and, and saying, well, maybe I need to do this, maybe I need to do that. The economy is such that you really got to have a more of a focused plan. Yeah, absolutely. When we look at all the different inputs that we put into our crops and the return on investment uh, that we need to make to, to maximize yield and that return on investment, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complex industry and, and farming is complex. And so we have research that shows and suggests that up to 60% of our yield is dependent on crop nutrition, on, on the fertility piece. We spend a lot of time talking about seed technology and different treatments and fungicides and insecticides and while all that is important uh, for the whole entire puzzle, you know, we really sometimes need to step back and look more, more at the basics. You know, the, the, the balanced crop nutrition, of course, is what we're here to, to dig into a little bit deeper. And, uh, you know, just to kind of kick things off, there's 17 essential minerals or essential nutrients. Now, oftentimes with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, we can't manage those. There's some cropping rotations and ways to manage that, but we really focus a lot of our training at Mosaic on 14 nutrients. So you have six macronutrients and eight micronutrients, and we'll kind of walk through uh, the six macronutrients and, and pick some of the, the micronutrients that we've spent a lot of time at Mosaic researching and uh, developing yield performance data for. So that's really what we're here to talk about this evening. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, Sherry, we know that uh, a lot of the nutrient management is, is really key to the success, like Kurt was talking about. So uh, what kind of nutrients are absolutely necessary to get the most out of a crop? Top of mind for nutrients usually comes with nitrogen, is where a lot of people focus, a lot of customers, farmers focus on nitrogen as being that number one nutrient that we need to be concerned about. Now we as a company, as Mosaic, that's not part of our core business, but nitrogen is, is key. And nitrogen helps with photosynthesis, nitrogen helps with the quality of that crop. And so it's, it's a key part of that balanced crop nutrition that we at Mosaic strive for. 
And Ross, she mentions uh, N, P, and K, the right. big three. Yep. And we all grew up knowing that that was, that was the main. But it goes deeper than that. Exactly. Uh, from, from what I understand. Exactly. There, there's P and K and well, and I'll, I'll talk about potassium here just for a moment. Most people don't realize that uh, plants need as much um, nitrogen, excuse me, potassium as they what as what they might need for nitrogen. Uh, potassium has a very large demand in the particular plant. Um, it has many roles within a plant. Enzymes, for example. And uh, just like uh, plants have, or excuse me, just like humans have pores on their skin, plants have pores as well. They're called stomates or stomata. And plants use potassium to help them regulate uh, those pores, so to speak, to weather drought. Um, if a plant is short of potassium, you might notice it on the margins or the outside of the leaves. It might be discolored into the yellow, yellow form. We try not to even get to that point first place by measuring uh, the, the amount of potassium in the soil. There's a tremendous reserve in the soil, but they're not always available when we think the plant might need it. So we get an estimate by tissue, uh, excuse me, by soil sampling. So that's potassium. Kurt has a couple of comments, I think, on phosphate as well, the other yeah, macronutrient. Yeah, absolutely. Just to, just to round out the big three again, you know, the traditional soil fertility, we call them the primary macronutrients, and then we'll go into the secondary macronutrients. But, you know, phosphorus is essential for all living organisms. Uh, as a general practice or rule of thumb, we think about phosphorus early in the season for a really healthy uh, root system. It does much, much more than that. It's involved in, in kind of the energy storage and transportation within the plant uh, with the ATP and, 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 and getting too deep into that. As a more practical standpoint, when we think about how much phosphorus we need for a corn plant, you know, there's a lot of these I states this year, we're looking at 200 bushel corn. So just as an idea, 200 bushel corn crop, you need about 0.35 pounds of P205 for every bushel. So if you do the math on that, 200 times 0.35, that's 70 pounds of P205 per acre that we're removing. Now that's assuming that your soil test shows adequate on the P level. That's just simply the grain removal you're taking off every year. If you contrast that or compare that just a little bit with the soybean, it's 0.7 pounds of P205 removed for every bushel. So you know a, a 50 bushel soybean crop is gonna pull off 35 pounds of, of P205 per acre. So just, just some ideas on numbers on how much phosphorus we're pulling off with some of these uh, high yields. But e even if you're using that much just to get to that point, that doesn't take into consideration if you had anything in the soil to begin with. You've got to be replacing more than what you're using each year, correct? Absolutely. It's building we, up. Yeah, we make the analogy back to to financial matters sometimes, it's like a bank account. We have to, we have debits and credits and we have to bal balance that accordingly and, and, and be very careful with, with how we balance that reservoir of soil nutrients. So uh, if farmers have the necessary micronutrients and the, and, the, and the macros, so are there nutrients that, other nutrients other than this that should be on the radar that they should be watching for? No, oh, absolutely, and Ross can share yeah. some more about the, some of the secondary so, macronutrients. Yeah, great, Kurt. So what we talked about here was the primary macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Mm -hmm. uh, the next set, so to speak, of macronutrients are the secondary macronutrients. And don't let the name fool you, just because we call them secondary doesn't mean they're any less important than the, the primary. They're just needed in quantities that are slightly less than the primary. They're still equally as important. And every one of these nutrients we talk about tonight uh, serves many different roles or functions within the plant. We're just kind of highlighting um, some of the key takeaways because they have they're such um, uh, diverse nutrients within the plant to do so many different roles. Um, but the secondary macronutrients are calcium, sulfur, and magnesium. We'll talk about those. Uh, but the first one, calcium, is in, very interesting because it has a sig significant role in the plant and the soil. In the plant, if I liken it back to the, to the human body, we um, in our bones and our teeth, calcium gives us a source of strength. In the plant, calcium also gives uh, the plant a source of strength in the cell walls and the cell membranes. And it uh, is, is really important um, to give that plant, again, like I mentioned, the, the source of strength. Um, in the soil, um, oftentimes, if growers are managing their soil pH rate, they do a pretty good job um, getting the calcium out there that the plant needs. Some farmers have naturally high pH soil. Sherry, I think you have some of those geographies in your area. Um, on our farm, we have uh, 7, 8 to 8.2 pH, so we don't often put on a lot of calcium. It's just naturally um, there in the soils in, in the right amount. 
Um, in the soil, what it does is it helps provide structure in the soil as well and strength, which can, can have some implications from uh, soil um, and air infiltration, water infiltration and aeration uh, implications. So a little bit on calcium. Um, other one is magnesium. Kurt, yep. magnesium. Yeah, magnesium, you know, again, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, those secondary macronutrients. When we think about magnesium, it's it's even it's easy to overlook magnesium just because so many of our soils in North America have adequate levels in the soil. But many times, much like we're, we're starting to discover with potassium and calcium, those aren't always plant available. So I think we need to have people looking more closely at some of the magnesium soil test levels, what's actually avail available. It's important to remember that uh, magnesium is e extremely important. It's, it's it, at the center, it's the main component of chlorophyll. Obviously chlorophyll is the greenness within the plant, the plant vigor. So it's an extremely uh, important uh, secondary macronutrient. You know, when we think about uh, removal, Sherry's uh, going to share with us a little bit more on sulfur. And we take off about 0.1 uh, pounds of magnesium for every bushel that we produce, and that's very similar to the sulfur removal value that we have as well. And many times people don't realize that a 200 bushel corn crop pulls off 20 pounds of magnesium, uh, you know, per acre. You know, that's just not something we often think about. We typically see those magnesium uh, deficiencies more in acidic or coarse textured soils. And typically as we get higher, uh, a little higher pH, calcium numbers tend to rise with, uh, with, with, with uh, more alkaline soils and we see more magnesium uptake on those more uh, calcitic type soils. So a little bit about magnesium and Sherry's gonna share a little bit more about sulfur with us. Okay, Sherry. Sulfur is unique as well when it comes to the macronutrients just in the sense where a lot like nitrogen, sulfur is very mobile, can be very mobile in the soil. So it's a nutrient that we wanna make sure we manage correctly and that we have a proper balance throughout the season. And so, one of the examples I often use with my customers, I, I work northern Minnesota, North Dakota, and Montana for my geography, and I'll ask farmers, you know, when you take your crop to the elevator, say you're taking your wheat crop to the elevator, what do we always shoot for, right? What, what do we always want to have high in our crop? And of course it's protein, it's going to be quality because we're going to get paid off of that. And sulfur is a key component in that. And one of the things that Mosaic has done and is unique is that we have created some products where we have two forms of sulfur. And so we have um, a product that has ammonium sulfate and elemental sulfur, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we move forward. In this, in this economic climate, I, and you and I were talking about this earlier before we went on the show today. In this economic climate, it's more important than ever to pull as many bushels off of uh, an area, one acre of, of soil, than, than it ever has been before. Do you, do you see that uh, we're starting to evolve? You know, it used to be, as you and I were talking about, Ross, uh, everybody talked about N, P, and K. Right. Are we starting to see an evolution now where we're looking more at some of these micronutrients like sulfur, like some of these others? We're also seeing that sulfur, regardless of where you're at, we have maps that show that it's, we're seeing lower and lower soil test and tissue sample levels everywhere, um, regardless of where we're at. And like Kurt mentioned, we're pulling some pretty nice crops off the last few years. And so we're starting to mine more of what we have left in the soil and we can only get by with that for so long. So, so it really wasn't locked up in the soil. It's always kind of been there, but we're just drawing so hard on it now that we're really starting to see. Uh, that and, and with sulfur as well, uh, a few decades ago we had the Clean Air Act. And so we used to talk, you know, some of the older farmers that I visit with will say, you know, we used to get sulfur out of our rain. And we don't see that as much today anymore as what we did 20 years ago. So this is a completely different paradigm now when it comes to crop nutrition and soil health uh, that we need to take a full spectrum look at rather than just some of the, some of the majors, is that? Absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the soil, the dynamic of how we're managing sulfur in the soil has changed and our plants have changed tremendously. And we'll talk about that here a little bit later on, but you know, as Sherry mentioned, we, we have new tools in the toolbox to help manage sulfur and to keep it available for longer. Um, Microcentrals is one that she mentioned, and we have another one called KMIC, and that has all immediately available sulfur the, at the time of application. But yeah, a couple new sources that we're working on to help uh, manage sulfur in our system. So there's a lot of different tools that are becoming exactly. more and more available for yeah. this. One of the main tools, though, is knowing what's there yep. to begin with. Is there, a, is there a learning curve or is there a, an obstacle to get over to get more soil sampling? Because, you know, years ago you went out, you took a, a few samples here and there, and it wasn't such a narrowed, focused approach as it is now. Yeah, I think 
it's important for, you know, Sherry mentioned tissue testing. I think a combination, typically in training we talk about, you know, the frequency of your soil test, how you go about that to get a, a proper soil core pulled, reputable lab, uh, same on the tissue sample, and then keeping good records on your yield. And that really plays back into the removal that we've been talking about and we'll continue to talk about here. It's important to know every crop how many nutrients were pulled off by that crop along with the soil test and tissue to pair all that up to make a decision on your fertilizer recommendation. When I was home over the weekend, I was having this discussion with a producer. And one of the points that he made to me, he says, John, he says, um, I don't know if I really need uh, to, to be able to sample because I've got my yield monitor now. But by the time it shows up on the yield monitor, are you already uh, you know, overdrawn on your, on your soil bank account? Yeah, we, we keep pretty close track, you know, and, and, and Dr. Bender has done some great work at University of Illinois on when the crop uptakes certain nutrients, what's removed in the grain. And so soil testing, you know, you're looking at this, th these are guidelines, this is kind of what's in the, the reservoir or the pool. But many times as potassium, for example, we have a lot still tied up in that stock or that stover. And so it becomes quite important to understand the timing and just kind of the overall dynamics of the crop physiology and the soil chemistry that are taking place. As far as the, uh, the necessary macronutrients, we kind of covered those uh, just a little bit. Are there other nutrients that should be on the radar? Yeah, absolutely. I think you hit on it earlier, John. I mean, we, we spent so much time as agronomists, as growers, as crop input suppliers and advisors thinking about nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And then it seemed like uh, there was a lot of interest in sulfur. A lot more university work was done and a lot more soil test labs saw a lot more sulfur numbers that were dropping in their state. So those were kind of the big four that we paid very close attention to. And the thing that, that the three of us see day in and day out now is really the micronutrients. So you'll plateau, plateau out on a yield level and then you'll say, what's next? And that's really when you have to start digging into these micronutrients. So we talked about the six macronutrients. There's eight micronutrients. And again, uh, for sake of time, we don't have time to go in depth for all eight micronutrients. We'll just pick a couple that we've really uh, uh, seen a lot of interest and a lot of good yield response from. And so just kind of rolling into that, uh, zinc is one that, that Mosaic has a very deep history on that micronutrient, working with that. Uh, zinc has many, many functions within the plant. You know, uh, it helps the phosphate move. It's, it's a lot of enzyme reactions, little light switches within the plant at different growth stages to help turn things on and off. You know, that zinc comes into play. So, um, you know, it's important when we talk about zinc and we look at, and we'll talk about our premium products, the way that zinc gets taken up, it's, it's very important with micronutrients to remember that a even blanket or a uniform nutrient distribution is the key to getting the micronutrients taken up. So many times with the blends, you know, Microessentials is a map-based product. We may put ammonium sulfate or zinc sulfate in that blend to, to, to fill the, the zinc needs. And too many times we end up with these hot spots of zinc out in the soil after that spinner or air machine has applied our fertilizer. There's a lot of root structure and systems in between and plants in between that don't have access to that zinc. So we have some solutions for that and that's part of the reason we've spent so much time uh, looking at zinc, crop nutrition. Looking forward to hearing about, uh, yep. about that a little bit more. In fact, before we go to break, we're going to open our phone lines. That number is 877-731 6733. We've covered a lot of ground here in our opening comments. I'd like you to call in with your questions and uh, a little bit later on we'll have you the opportunity where you can also send us a tweet if you so choose. Maybe you have a, a picture of your crop that you have some concerns about or have some questions about. We'd be happy to uh, look at those. You can also tweet us at crop underscore nutrition. We'll be watching for that. Again, that telephone number 877-731-6733. Stay tuned. We'll be right back here on Rural America Live on RFD TV. Welcome back to Rural America Live, where we're joined by three crop nutrition experts. We know that supplying crops with the right amount of nutrients is key to be a successful yield, but how do farmers make sure their crops are getting those nutrients? Well, we're going to find out. We're, our, our phone lines are open, too, if you'd like to give us a call. 877-731-6733. And as I mentioned earlier, you can also tweet us at crop underscore nutrition. If you want to send us pictures, you want to send us a question, we're monitoring that right now. Uh, doctor, I'll go back to you here for just a moment. Uh, during the break, 
Uh, I want to share with the audience, if you don't mind, what we were talking about. We were talking about the importance of boron. You know, and that's something that 25, 30 years ago, we didn't talk much about. Is it, is it really become that important? I think where we are with boron today is perhaps where we were with sulfur 10 to 15, maybe 20 years ago. It's a, it's a nutrient for those that soil test and tissue test. It has quickly um, arisen to one of the most um, interested nutrients by growers and, and uh, retailers. Boron has many roles within the plant, but you know one in particular is its role in pollination. Um, adequate boron levels are absolutely essential to ensure that our product, our, excuse me, our crops go through pollination well. Kernel set and seed set um, is sort of sunk in, so to speak. So on corn, for example, you might notice inadequate boron causing uh, poor kernel set or tip fill on, right on the tip. Um, the problem with boron is it's kind of a tricky nutrient to manage if you're not careful. There's an old wives tale out there that if you put too much boron near the seed, you might cause some injury to that particular seedling. And that's absolutely right, you gotta be careful. So ensuring that every plant has access to just a little bit of boron and that it's available all season long is, is difficult, but really essential in order to getting responses out of boron. And uh, Mosaic has created a new potash source now that has boron within it multiple forms of boron. Each granule has just a little bit of boron in it that helps solve challenges associated with distribution and season long availability. And that's called a spire. And that's a, a new tool and resource we're working on. Okay, so this is, this is broadcast, this isn't banded. Yes sir, it's a dry fertilizer broadcasted. Um, people have explored many different ways of, of using a spire. And uh, we, we recommend that you broadcast it, but there are some uh, very confident and daring individuals that uh, explore putting potash and boron uh, near the seed and they've been successful. But yes, we recommend uh, uh, manage, using a spire like you would normal potash. It's a potash-based nutrient source. Very interesting. Uh, while we're uh, with you here on this topic, I wanna go and talk about supplying crops with the right nutrients. It's really critical. So how do farmers make sure that they're getting exactly what they need and where they need it? Because let's face it, right. uh, it's not the good old days where you can just kind of guess at it anymore. It needs to be really focused. Right, exactly. And the, the framework that people use to help manage uh, their nutrients is something called a 4-hour nutrient uh, stewardship. And what it is, is it's basically a framework for uh, farmers and retailers and uh, industry professionals to help farmers achieve their crop profit and yield goals, while also being good stewards of the land. It's based around the concept of four R's, right? Source, rate, time, and place. And uh, the source is uh, the first one I listed and um, um, arguably one of the most important because the source that you select will dictate how the other factors are managed behind it. Um, so we'll talk about source more later. We'll give it its due justice. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about uh, rate first. And uh, if you think about your soil as a, as a piggy bank or a checking account, so to speak, as Kurt mentioned earlier, um, if your goal is to, excuse me, to sustain some level of fertility in your soil, um, you want to replace the quantity of nutrients that are removed on an annual basis. Um, and that removal rate is a function of the crop that you're growing and the yield level. Now recently we've grown some pretty high yielding crops that have removed um, nutrients at faster rates than ever before. And that has sort of changed the fundamental um, approach that we use to manage fertility. Um, but back to, back to that, um, we think about where those crops are acquiring those nutrients. From one, the soil, or primarily uh, and secondarily the two from fertility. There was a really neat uh, and interesting study done by the International Plant Nutrition Institute. That's an independent organization that quantifies soil test, uh, phosphate and potassium and other nutrient levels every five years. And uh, what they do is a hot button nutrient, for example, is, is phosphate. So what they do is they uh, estimate um, soil test phosphate levels from around the US and Canada based on results they get back from soil testing laboratories. And they group the soil test results into these different buckets zero to five part per million, five to 10 part per million, all the way up to 50 plus part per million. And they had some interesting findings that are related to this rate of removal and the crops that were growing recently because of the yield. In short, the soil test phosphate levels have dropped fairly dramatically in some states. Um, so that was finding number one. <clears throat> finding number two is where the drop is occurring. Um, the area where the bucket, so to speak, where it's dropping the fastest is the highest testing bucket, those above 50 part per million in your soils. And it's dropping quite rapidly. 
Um, there are some geographies in this country where soil test levels above 50 part per million are probably not necessary. So cutting back and bringing those back into the adequate range is probably a good thing. The concerning end of things though is that we have a lot of soils in this adequate range that are also dropping now into the deficient buckets, the zero to five, five to 10, 10 to 15. So the right rate is absolutely critical if you want to sustain some level of fertility in your soil. I talked about phosphate, phosphate, but it applies to other nutrients as well. So understanding removal and replenishing those nutrients is really important. And with a, you mentioned different geographies, right. different soil types. Uh, there are so many different right. soil types from not just uh, state right. to state, but even county to county. And sometimes within a county, mm -hmm. there right. are so many different ones. We've talked a lot about crops and, and about how you've got these nutrients. I gotta ask, what about our uh, what about our friends who have pasture conditions too? Uh, Same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's important. I mean, we're putting animals out on the pasture. Um, they are harvesting some of the that, that feed that feedstock out there, and we're they are removing that that feedstock, and thus they are mining some of those nutrients from that ground. On the flip side, you think about the whole circle of life and the biology of life. There's some nutrients uh, going out back onto that uh, cropping rotation, but it's important to soil test those acres as well because oftentimes it's a common practice to spread nutrients on that ground um, at the right rate and at the right time, which is you know what Sherry was gonna talk about here. Okay. Uh, you can sure give us a call if you would like. We'd be glad to take your phone calls. And uh, you've got a panel of great experts here that can answer your questions. It's 877-731-6733. It's a toll-free number. You can dial in right now. We'd love to hear from you if you have some questions, maybe some comments. But uh, this, is the, uh, this is your opportunity to ask a panel of experts some very key questions on how you can optimize your yields and optimize your profit margins. It's 877-731-6733. You can also give us a, a tweet if you would like to do that. We'll also take those questions at crop underscore nutrition. And uh, you can sure chime in. We'd be happy to answer those questions. Sherry, I want to uh, uh, direct a question to you. Uh, what are some of the fertilizer technologies that growers uh, might incorporate in some of their, their farming systems to be able to maximize yield? Because let's face it, maximizing yield is what this is, this is all meaning. This is where we're headed. Right. That's one of the key things that um, Mosaic has done for, for people in my role as a technical sales manager is being able to share with the customers, with our farmers today of some of the new technology that we have and that Mosaic has developed. And one of the first ones for me that comes to mind is our microessentials. And microessentials is a 12% nitrogen, 40% phosphorus, 10% sulfur, which is two forms of sulfur. And then in some cases, we also have a 1% zinc as well. So we have a family of microessentials that's available to our customers. And they will also have, as Ross had mentioned, a new product, new for us in the dry fertilizer business called Aspire, which is a 58% potash, potassium, and a half a percent of boron, which new as of this year has two forms of boron. It sounds to me like you've got a, a complete um, toolbox full, if I can use that term again, yeah. uh, right. of, of tools to be able to match up what not only fits cropping conditions, but soil conditions as well, um, current nutritional needs, and uh, of course application as well, because application can vary from time to time um, in uh, different geographies, right. as well as whatever it is you happen to be growing, and weather conditions as well. Let's face it, sometimes you can't always get a, a floater in in a field right. sometimes, right. Or, or conditions like that. Absolutely. So you have many different different options then? Right, so as dry, we, um, for example, in my geography, for canola, for wheat, winter wheat, guys are putting it on on a broadcast. They can put it down with their air seeders so they can put it off to the side on a two by two. They can put it right with the seed. It's very safe, safe products to use um, with the exception of Aspire where as it sits today, we do require that to be a broadcast. Sure. I know that you probably get an opportunity to talk to a lot of producers on a regular basis. What do you hear back? What are some of their questions or what are some of their concerns when you start talking to them about these options? and, and uh, how they need to look at a full spectrum of their of their nutritional needs. So it's always fun for me to talk to the farmers just because I grew up on a farm and so can relate very well to where they're at and uh, the experiences that they go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it's fun to share what we're doing and it's fun to share something unique and something different because it um, gives you something new to talk about and it keeps it exciting and farmers wanna hear that. They wanna hear what's new what's different and 
and ultimately how can they raise a better crop and ultimately that's what we're all shooting for right is how can we help the farmer have a better yield sure Ross, what about getting over, uh, you know, some, some producers uh, have their minds made up, okay, I know exactly what my field needs, this is what I've put on it for years. Right. Is there a learning curve uh, on some of this new technologies and some of the new ways of, of monitoring and, and, and meeting the needs of that nutrition that, uh, that the crop needs? That's a, that's a very thought-provoking question, John, because um, my experience um, in uh, graduate school was understanding the plant, not as much about the soil. We figured out what the plant needs are to grow high-yielding crops. So then, you know, when we flip that on a, on a 180, how can we provide that crop nutrition from the soil and, and plant practices? Um, and, and to go along with that, I mean, we, we like to talk about um, the soil test as a starting point. We'll talk about this more here in a moment in the tissue test. Um, what we've done now is we've designed nutrient sources that we think can help um, make nutrient management easy and make it easier. Um, they, there is a learning curve, yes. Yes, there is, John. But these nutrient sources, like microessentials, for example, is a MAP-based phosphate source. Common phosphate sources out there today, MAP and, and DAP. Um, this is a MAP-based nutrient source that can simply be, um, you pull out your MAP or pull out your DAP in your system and you can put microessentials in there. So it's a tool to help manage your phosphate, like Sherry mentioned. But now, um, because of the pretty large demand that our crops have for sulfur, it's a tool that helps you provide a great foundation for sulfur as well. Um, for in, the, uh, in terms of aspire, as we were talking about earlier, all crops need uh, potash or potassium in some way, shape, or form. So this tool is, uh, could be used as a replacement completely or partially uh, in a system where they're looking to manage potash. And now you have a tool that makes boron management really easy and it works pretty well. Very good. We've got a, uh, got a phone call here. Uh, well, let's go to Minnesota. Tony joins us now. Good evening, Tony. Thank you very much for your call. Uh, what, what's your question tonight? Uh, I'm wondering about fall application of potassium and phosphorus. Okay. Uh, what, yep. what, what about it? And this is for hay production. For hay production, okay. okay. Uh, yes. Anybody want to address that? Yeah, so um, to, get, to answer your question, John, um, there, uh, in regards to hay production, um, it is very common to put on fall applied um, crop nutrient applications. In some cases, they even like to do it before the last cut to ensure that there's opportunity for those crop nutrients to experience some precipitation or rainfall to work it into the soil. And then the crops can take up some of those nutrients, the potassiums, the phosphate, maybe some of the other nutrients. It has a really important role in winter hardiness um, and uh, is one of the reasons why we like to put them on in the fall. In addition to that, uh, some people ask about fall applications of phosphate and potash in, in a corn soybean rotation. And uh, what we see is the studies Iowa State, for example, is um, that, that we sometimes get questions about, is it better to put it on in the fall when we have some time or in the spring um, when we're closer to when the crop needs it, but our, our production schedule is a little more constrained. And the short answer to the question is, is uh, it, it really doesn't matter. The yield data suggests that you put it on in the fall or the spring, the yield response is, is very similar. So John, or excuse me, uh, Tony, continue with your, your practices of fall applied. Um, and I think you're, you're in good shape. Tony brings, and Tony, thank you very much for your call. Tony brings up a good point also here, because we were talking about earlier this evening about uh, not just corn, not just soybeans, but alfalfa as well. Right. Um, this, this complete crop nutrient picture uh, can be spread over pasture, uh, hay, all kinds of different crops. Um, and, and certainly that alfalfa is one of those. Alfalfa has a, a tremendous demand for nutrients. So you think about um, for every ton of alfalfa that's removed from a field, you're removing uh, about 50 to 60 units of K2O. So for every ton, you need to replace it with about 100 pounds of potash. It has a tremendous demand. So it's, uh, it's really important that you continue to replenish those nutrients that are removed, especially in a, a system like, like Tony was talking about. You can quickly deplete uh, your soil fertility without even knowing it uh, in the absence of nutrient replacement. 
Tony, thank you very much for your call. Again, our phone lines are open, 877-731-6733. You can call in with your questions, or you can also tweet us at crop, C-R-O-P underscore nutrition. We'd be happy to uh, take your tweets as well if you have questions for our panelists. Let's go to uh, Michigan now. Gary is on the line with us. Good evening, Gary. Thank you very much for calling Rural America Live. What's your question for our panelists? Well, we've been dairy farming here for 20 years and uh, we haven't put more than 100 pounds of potash on any of our fields in the last 20 years and uh, I'm coming to find out that our levels are just fine um, there's a there's a field out in Iowa where they've had corn for 50 years and their potash levels are going up and they haven't put a drop of potash on it explain that to us and how harmful is that the chloride that's in potash on your soil. Yeah, Gary, it's a it's a, a very good question. You know, one of the things we've we've got a lot of calibration and correlation data with our our university and our commercial soil test labs to help us better understand you know crop nutrient response uh, to to potash applications. One thing that, that we're really beginning to better understand and realize, and, and a lot of this work is coming out of North Dakota State University, is how different clay layers uh, factor in. The mineralogy, the parent material, uh, makes potassium available or unavailable. And we see a lot of situations in wetting and drying cycles, you know. Uh, John and I earlier had, a, had, had discussions about certain drought range, regions, and then, you know, southern Minnesota, we've seen flooding, but nevertheless, all those weather factors really play into this availability uh, of potassium. So I think going forward, you'll see a lot more research and, 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 a, and a better understanding of when we can expect to see a potassium response in situations where a soil test today may say that we're, we're adequate, right? So um, I hope that helps a little bit, Gary. Gary, thank you very much for your call. We also had a caller uh, call in was asking about chelated. Uh, do you want to expand on that a little bit? And, and uh, as, as far as those kind of nutrients and, and that, that, type of, um, that type of application in... in chelated micronutrients, chelated, yes. perhaps, is yep. what they're referring to. Yes. Yeah, so chelated micronutrients, the premise there is that we, we basically protect the micronutrients with an organic jacket and it prevents them from reacting with all the other stuff in the soil which can make uh, nutrient use efficiency go down. It's a problem. So chelation is a technology that they use to protect those nutrients and keep them available for longer. It's a fantastic technology. I mean, the goal is to ensure that every plant has access to those micronutrients and that they're available when the crop needs it. So whatever fertilizer practice, whether it's a source, timing, placement, whatever that that grower employs to keep those nutrients available for when they are needed is absolutely perfect. Well, as you can see, we've got a panel of uh, great uh, folks here that can answer your questions. It's 877-731-6733. The number's right here on your screen. Or if you'd like to send us a tweet, we'd be more than happy to answer your tweet as well. That is at the at sign, crop, C-R-O-P underscore nutrition. Or just pick up the phone and give us a call. 877-731-6733. Um, so a lot of great questions here tonight uh, yeah, about yeah. this. So obviously, you know, there has been somewhat of a vacuum in understanding some of the importance of, of having the, the proper nutrition and how it fits into every operation. No, absolutely. You know, just kind of going back to our, our four R's, I mean, the, the placement, the timing, when you look at some of these technologies like, like Mosaic has brought to the industry, I mean, it's important, and that's why we're here this evening, to, to really highlight the fact that every, each and every nutrient has a different properties within the soil and within the plant, right? There's certain nutrients that are mobile, there's certain nutrients that are immobile, and that ties very much back to, to one of our caller's questions, you know, about fall application on, on hay with potassium. We know that potassium's immobile. It moves slightly, you know, uh, through the season or through the year, but, but P and K are immobile nutrients you know, but yet they can have mobility within the plant. So it's important to understand each one of these nutrients. And then as we've discussed, you know, with our four R's, especially with the source, understanding that the, the timing and the placement and what those sources have in, in them, the technology that they provide with maybe that early season and that later season, sulfur needs, 
bore on needs and, 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 and just looking at the overall package that you get and when to apply those products. Is there, a, is there a big difference too also, I know that you folks cover a wide geography, but do you see a lot of difference when it comes to uh, the difference between maybe some more arid areas like western Kansas, like where you and I are from, or uh, some of the areas that get a lot more rainfall when it comes to these, uh, the availability of some of these nutrients? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, that's one of the, the beauty, that's a beauty of this role. Uh, Kurt and I and Sherry, we have a chance to work in a lot of different geographies and learn that there's, there's no one way to do agriculture. Um, the way I do it on my farm back at home in Cleveland, Wisconsin, population 700, is different than what people do in Sherry's area and Kurt's area and on your farm and what they do in eastern Canada and, and south central Florida and out in California and Texas. There's, there's no one way to do it. And the beauty of a, a role uh, like Kurt and I and Sherry have and the opportunity to join and listen in on, on TV shows like this is you get to learn how other people do it and, and maybe consider adopting some of those strategies on their own farm. Our phone lines are open, 877-731-6733. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, we've got a panel of folks here with a lot of answers. You know, that's one of the things that when uh, I was working on getting ready to do this show and in my research, uh, Mosaic has got a very deep reservoir of knowledge and experience in crop nutrition. No, absolutely. You know, we've got... Uh, over 12 years of small plot replicated trials and we, we build technical bulletins that we call Agrifax. We're quite proud of that. You know, our R&D program, the new product development team that, that Ross and I set on, you know, we've really spent a lot of time looking at balanced crop nutrition, what micronutrients should we pair with that macronutrient, what ratio is needed for the bulk of the, the, the main crops, how they react to your point, John, in, in really heavy rainfall areas with coarse textured soils, sandy soils. We need to slow this mobile nutrient down versus there's other situations like Ser Sherry's geography where we have elemental sulfur and we have more northern latitudes, but a, a, a product like Microessentials still works because we spend the time and the money to look at oxidation of, of elemental sulfur to sulfate sulfur, which is ultimately what the plant needs. And just all the research and development that we do around all these nutrients and the pairings and the time and the, the placement, uh, we're, we're qu quite proud of that, you know. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful Very. aspect of that is we, that's all for public knowledge, right? We have that on our websites, cropnutrition.com. We have it on our microessentials.com, aspireboron.com. So all that information that we are sharing and that we're talking about is available to to anybody. Very good. And you know, one last plug is Mosaic works very closely with a lot of different universities. Mosaic, Mosaic, we don't have our own research farm that sits in, sits in Illinois or Iowa or Indiana. We work with uh, exclusively with universities and third party folks that help us conduct this research. Uh, and they do a fantastic job. So we, we get the results back from them and we convert it into what we think is a deliverable that our customers, which our retailers and farmers can use. But it's, uh, it's really great to have some outstanding resources like universities to partner with. Very good. Thank you. Well, be sure and give us a call, 877-731-6733. We're gonna take a real quick break, give you time to uh, get the phone, dial us up. We'd love to hear from you. And we'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back to Rural America Live, where we're joined by three crop nutrition experts today. Dr. Ross Bender, Kurt Wolfolk, and Sherry uh, Coke, uh, or, uh, Cook are here with us, and they're sharing the importance of all nutrients and how to make sure that crops are getting them. Uh, so uh, let's continue our conversation. In fact, let's go right straight to the phone right now, uh, where uh, we go to Alabama. Frank is standing by. Frank, thank you very much for calling in tonight. What's your question? My question is, how important do y'all feel that if the pH is 5.8, in other words, our custom farm that used to farm a lot of acres, but anyway, I always insist on my people to have the pH between 6.3 and 6.6, because it will, if 5.9 will not show you the actual availability of phosphorus and potash. Do y'all agree with that? Yes. Yes, uh, Frank, I, I agree 100% with that. I mean, the, the pH is, um, there's, there's no quantity of crop nutrition you can put down and be successful if your pH is wrong. pH regulates how well and how available some of those nutrients are. So sometimes the best fertilizer source truly is lime. 
Um, so in the case of managing crop nutrition, the fundamental starting point is getting the pH where it needs to be. And if you can get that pH right, you keep some of your other nutrients, the potassiums, the phosphorus, is some, a bunch of the micronutrients um, available. And that's the foundation. And in some of your soils, Frank, in Alabama, um, having adequate calcium and magnesium is also really important. So getting that pH where it needs to be will also uh, help you in, in managing those nutrients. I would also add that, you know, knowing, knowing the crop uh, is also important. So we, we know that alfalfa and, and clovers and legumes, they need a much different pH uh, than a corn, soybean, wheat plant. So keep in mind kind of those, those, those ideal ranges that, that you already mentioned there, Frank, uh, depending on what crop you're looking at. Freddie's calling in also. Uh, Freddie, thank you very much for the phone call. Uh, what state are you calling from? Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. <clears throat> okay, what's your question tonight? Yeah, my question is um, what, what nutrient deficiency would lead to severe leaf spot and rust in crops like hybrid pearl millet in extremely wet years? Great question, Freddie, and because I cover the eastern United States, I feel um, obligated to contribute. Um, Great question. In some of the soils that I suspect you're experiencing, you have fairly low CEC soils, sandier light soils, and, and things leach through those soils. Things, the nutrients that leach the most are, are nitrate, sulfate, and borate. So nitrogen, uh, excuse me, nitrogen, sulfur, and boron. Um, and in the, in the case of uh, soils that have a CEC that low, you might be experiencing um, nutrients that leach outside of that, even things like potash, uh, which can leach under severe conditions like that. Um, Freddie, I'd like to you know, sort of dig into that a little bit more. It, it may be tied or um, interacting with a nutrient, but it sounds like there's some other disease um, you know, issues or concerns that uh, are warranted to check out as well. But um, the, the first starting point is, 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 again, doing some soil tests and ensuring that you have availability of some of those nutrients that can leach pretty easily. From um, North Carolina, let's go west down I-40 to Robert in Oklahoma. He's got a question. Good evening, sir. Hello. What's, what's your question? Uh, I was wondering how long, you know, on a fertilizer does it take for it to become available to the plant? And check out gardenproductivity.com. It would sure help farmers. And what is gardenproductivity.com? Uh, Robert, what is it saying? Well, it's uh, our company that uh, has... Uh, micronutrients makes the micronutrients in the soil go to work and breaks fertilizers down quicker to go into the plant makes them available and robert brings up a good point that's what uh, that's what this is all about uh is making things available that the plant can use and and uh, really really make the most of kurt uh, why is it uh, so necessary to replace these these nutrients like like robert was talking about because it has to happen time and time again it isn't just a one-time fix all yeah absolutely robert you know i mean with the uh with the micronutrients especially ross touched on it we spend a lot of time talking about ph and how that affects the soil chemistry and a lot of these a lot of these micronutrients uh, it depends on that that CEC. It depends on the clay layers, the weather pattern, uh, just the overall soil chemistry to really hone in on, on the right answer. And and products that can be used with uh, some of these micronutrients or even macronutrients and their availability. So it's a very good question. It's one that that we look at and we research, but it's 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 a it's a tough one to answer without knowing the soil test values and all the different parameters. You know, John, back to your point. I mean. It's important uh, to understand uh, why a field can't just magically regenerate all these nutrients. You know, much like your vehicle, it doesn't just automatically fill its tank, right? So we're p constantly pulling off these high yield crops, many times bases, and we've talked about some different removal values. So we've got to come back in and, and replace or replenish all that removal that we're taking off. You know, and again, just referencing something we mentioned earlier in the show, uh, the International Plant Nutrition Institute, IPNI is a research arm, uh, nonprofit research arm. We look pretty closely at their data, you know, and, and again, the past 10 to 15 year, years worth of data where they've aggregated soil test results has shown declines in a lot of these nutrients. And so, again, this is a bit of a caution flag that we're pulling off more, we're mining more from the soil than what we're replenishing. So, you know, again, we just have to be very uh, aware of that 
and uh, applying fewer of those soils, uh, applying fewer of those nutrients than what is being taken off is, is dangerous over time, right? Bert from Ohio is on the phone. Bert, what's your question? Uh, thank you for taking my question. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I have it answered. We uh, live where it's really flat here in Ohio, western part of Ohio, and we strip tillage, and we put our fertility in the strip, and and uh, I'm wondering if we uh, put our micronutrients in that uh, area would be satisfactory. Yes, no, the short answer to the question, Bert, is yes, absolutely. Uh, you're, you're accomplishing multiple goals when you do strip tillage. Um, one, you're trying to put the nutrients where the crop roots are gonna be. Uh, two, you're doing some tillage, but where you're gonna plant so you have quicker warm up. And then uh, number three, you're letting some of the field be untilled um, for erosion control measures. And when you put your primary macronutrients there like phosphorus and potassium, and then some of your micronutrients, what you're doing is you're putting those nutrients out in advance of planting right in the row. Micronutrients work the same exact way. Uh, Microessentials SZ and uh, Aspire KMEG as well as a great nutrient source works very well. They're, they're very compatible on those type of systems. So great practice, Bert. Uh, I encourage you to keep it up. Thank you. Bert, just to, just to add to that, you know, we've seen a lot of strip till work uh, in Minnesota and, and parts of Iowa. And, and again, to, to back up what Ross said, just great results. Just a little bit of a warning there, Ross mentioned it earlier when it comes to micronutrients. Just be aware with your boron, the rate that you're putting down and, and, and that placement of seed next to that boron load. It's just, there's an extra uh, awareness that needs to be had around the boron rate with where you're, you're putting that seed. So keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Let's go to the phone. We have time for one more quick phone call. Tim from Arkansas joins us. Good evening, Tim. What's your question? Well, I, I, I was wondering uh, about uh, I'm a cow calf man in Arkansas, and I mainly uh, just run cattle, but I've got hay fields. Uh, I'm also a chicken grower, and I use chicken litter for fertilizer. And uh, uh, I put more of it on my hay ground than I do my pasture, just for the simple reason that I always understood the nutrients recycled through the cow back to the pasture. And I'd just like to know if that's true. Uh, if I add any fertilizer, it's usually phosphate. And I just wonder what they think about what I'm doing. I think that's a good good practice, Tim. Um, and I encourage you to keep it up. I mean, I, I live in the heart of dairy country in Wisconsin, and we have similar challenges managing those crop nutrients. We have to put those, uh, those manure fer fertility sources somewhere, and they gotta go back out on the field. Um, some of the you have to weigh the the, the challenges associated with, with that as well and, and one of the challenges is um, you, you you aren't able to control the analysis of what you're putting down it's a set analysis of certain p n and k um, an advantage of having a, a program like that and working it in conjunction with a fertilizer source uh, dry fertilizer sources is you're able to tailor that to what the, those crops will need all right. Thank you very much, Tim. We appreciate the call. Uh, we've got about 60 seconds left here in the show. Sherry, where can folks find out more information if they want to continue to find out uh, more about Mosaic and, and all that you offer? You can check out mosaic.com. It would be a great source, and you can reach all of our other links, the microessentials.com, Aspire Boron, and uh, KMAG. You can find out information on our websites and uh, all funnel through each other. Right. CropNutrition.com is a big one as well. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Any final thoughts from? Uh, yeah. I just want one quick, quick closing statement. Um, be a be a student of the crop and turn every opportunity into a, every opportunity into a learning experience. So. And that's what it's all about. And we are all so blessed to we be are. involved Absolutely. with agriculture and to be able to serve agriculture Absolutely. and work with uh, the salt of the earth people. Uh, so thank you very much all for being on the program well, tonight. You, and thank you to you for calling in tonight and joining us here on Rural America Live. From all of us here at RFD-TV, good night from Rural America's most important network.